I want to say how honored I am to be here, uh, invited by the Professional Institute of the Public Service of Canada. I have long been an admirer of the public service, uh, and I guess everybody says that to you. Uh, but, but I actually mean it, and I've been saying it for a long time. It's made me very unpopular with business audiences. Uh, in fact, I go farther and I argue that what we need is an expansion of the public sector and the public service. <laughs> uh, I, I thought I would maybe just tell you a little bit more about myself, just to elaborate on what Denise said. Uh, she mentioned my book, The Trouble with Billionaires, that I wrote with Neil Brooks, a tax professor at Osgoode Hall Law School. Maybe just to give you a little sense of that book. I mean, there's lots of book about books out there about billionaires and the new rich. In fact, even our foreign minister, foreign affairs minister, has written one. But, but I, I guess I would say that those books, including that book, uh, fall into a category that I would call sort of flattering to the new rich. You know, the describes the sort of great contributions they've made in the global era, et cetera, et cetera. Our book is a little different. Um, I guess the best way to capture it is that it's kind of written more in the spirit of the group of protesters that marched down Wall Street right after the 2008 financial crash, and they were carrying a placard that said, jump, you fuckers. <laughs> So I guess I just want to point out that our book fits more into the jump you fuckers genre of books about the, the new rich. <laughs> now I, I, I want to talk today about outsourcing, which is a subject I understand you're very familiar with. Um, and, and, and it is, of course, part of a broader agenda, an agenda of uh, privatization, shrinking the public sector, austerity, social spending cuts, tax cuts for the rich, a tax on labor. We, we, we're familiar with this agenda. I'll broadly call it the conservative revolution. And by that, I don't mean big C conservative. Uh, in fact, I think small c. Uh, we mean the business elite, the conservative ideologues, you know, and their allies in business and in uh, academe, that kind of thing, think tanks. Um, it, basically, these, these are very powerful forces, though, as, as we know. And it, that whole kind of conservative revolution, I would argue, reached its height, reached its zenith under Stephen Harper. Uh, but I think the encouraging thing to remember, I always like to think we're in the post-Harper era, nice to be reminded of that, uh, but it's encouraging also when we look back to realize that yes, he was elected multiple times, but never with more than 40% popular support. Uh, there was never widespread support for that conservative revolution. And it was really just the way our electoral system worked that he managed to stay in power so long. And, and when Justin Trudeau finally arrived in 2015, uh, I think there was a great deal of anticipation, a great deal of excitement about him as the kind of anti-Harper that was going to bring in you know, overturn that whole conservative revolution. And, and let's just say, uh, you know, I think it would be churlish of me not to admit there's been significant improvement. For one thing, there's an end to the attack on science. That, that's good. Um, there, there's, you know, we have a much more diverse cabinet. Uh, we have the welcoming of refugees. I mean, these, these are some very positive developments. But I guess I would want to point out that, you know, when it comes to progressive policy, and Trudeau does present himself as a progressive, and of course he scooped up all the NDP vote pretty well, um, th that I think he is a, a phony progressive, uh, at least in the sense that he very much maintains 
the same broad economic agenda that we've had under Harper. Uh, now, he's, he's certainly not like his father. I mean, his father, and, and I disagreed with many things Pierre Trudeau did, but I did always admire the way he was independent of Bay Street. Uh, and I don't think we can say that of Justin Trudeau. I think Justin Trudeau is very comfortable and very cozy with Bay Street. Uh, Pierre Trudeau actually had Alan McKechn as his finance minister. I don't know if you remember Alan McKechn, if any of you are that old, but he was a deeply progressive man, uh, you know, from basically from the social justice uh, Christian tradition. Uh, you know, in, in comparison, Justin Trudeau has Bill Morneau, <laughs> who's uh, straight out of the Canadian establishment. You know, for, for all the, the diversity in Trudeau's cabinet, you know, the key guy, the guy that's got real power, the finance minister, is a, you know, white, rich male, uh, married to a McCain heir. I mean, this guy is establishment in every conceivable way. Uh, so, so Trudeau, in trying to live up to his image as a progressive, he's, he's done a few tweaking of economic policies. Um, you know, we have slightly higher taxes on the rich. We have slightly more social spending. We have a slight reduction in outsourcing. Um, but recall, like Trudeau before the election, uh, and to his credit, he, he promised that he would roll back outsourcing uh, to, I think it was 2005, 2006 levels. Uh, he hasn't done that. He's made some inroads there, but as somebody commented in the media, at the rate he's going, it'll probably be about another 10 years before we reach that 2005, 6 level, which was still a significant level of outsourcing. The simple truth is we have a huge amount of outsourcing. Uh, we've, there's estimates as high as 10 billion a year. Uh, and, and it's important, this is not just temporary, you know, filling uh, special, special functions, special projects. These are long-term commitments. People uh, in, in these outsource jobs for long periods of time, long-term contracts with major outsourcing firms. Essentially what we've ended up with uh, is what the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives has quite rightly called a, a shadow public service uh, with, with all this outsourcing. So this leads to the question, why? You know, uh, just why, uh, you know, what accounts for this extreme level of, of outsourcing? And, and, and there's some, uh, you know, simple explanations, managers, find it easier and you know, more appealing maybe to hire people without going through the whole public service uh, formal procedures, which can be long and, and somewhat complicated. But, but I guess I would argue, and I want to elaborate on that in a second, but you know, given the extent of what we're talking about, we're talking about billions of dollars a year in outsourcing. Uh, I, I don't think it's enough to simply say managers maybe find it more convenient to do it this way. I think we're talking about direction that comes from very high levels within the government. <coughs> There's been a decision to go that route, particularly under Harper, and a decision on the part of the, Harp, of, of the Trudeau government to basically continue down that route. While Trudeau is not a a, a right-wing ideologue in the way Harper is, I think it's fair to say that he's not terribly strong or interested in standing up to a lot of those uh, strong conservative forces. And now at first, you might look at it and think, well, this is cost-saving, you know, it's all about cost-saving, all this outsourcing. But, as I'm sure you know, the evidence in fact shows that it doesn't save money, that uh, in fact it costs more. There, there's a, one study that looked at the four key departments, public works, national defense, human resources, and emergency preparedness, which are the four key departments using outsourcing, that over a five-year period, their payroll with the 
government restraint only went up 9%, but their outsourcing bill went up 100%. So, so this is false economy if there's some ex argument that we're doing this to save money. In fact, the CCPA, Center, Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives, emphasized that all this outsourcing is costing the government at least a billion dollars extra a year. And it's bad policy in other ways. I mean, it's bad policy. It undermines the government's hiring goals, bilingualism. Oh, I meant to say, je suis très content d'être ici cet après-midi. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's a little pathetic. Um, uh, and goals like th that the hiring in the public service will be you know, fair and impartial. That's terribly important with government. Uh, and also there's the whole problem that when we outsource so much, we don't develop institutional knowledge. We spend all that money, we don't get that institutional knowledge stays with the private sector. Then of course there's the privacy concerns. I'm not telling you stuff, I know, you, I mean, I know you know all this, but just to go through it quickly, privacy concerns on part of taxpayers and quality control, we've just been talking about Phoenix, the Phoenix disaster, and yet, you know, uh, we have the situation like with NetFile, developed in-house within the CRA in order to be a tax collection service, works extremely well. You know, there was no need to outsource that, and yet, you know, we have this fiasco privately, we have success stories publicly within the public system that we don't draw sufficient attention to. So given all these negatives of outsourcing, I think it's striking that outsourcing is so extensive the way it is in the public service. And I, I think we have to conclude that part of the reason for that is pressure coming from the business community and the corporate world. I mean, clearly there would be a pressure from those, you know, IBMs, uh, CGI, that kind of, those companies that want those contracts. But more broadly, I would argue there's a pressure coming from the corporate world, from all those people trying to promote the conservative re revolution. Because the basic aim of the conservative revolution is to shrink the size and scope of government. That's really what it's all about. They want to shrink the public domain and replace that with, the, with an expanded private domain. They want to do this for simple reasons because that will expand their profit-making opportunities. And, and in the U.S., for instance, uh, these forces trying to, trying to push this, sometimes called the libertarian agenda, uh, are very, very strong and very, very aggressive. I mean, there's the famous quote by Grover Norquist, uh, who argued that, you know, he wanted to shrink government to the point that it would fit in a bathtub. <laughs> Uh, now, now, we don't get such colorful language probably in, Tor in Canada, uh, but, but essentially I would argue that's the same goal. The people pushing the conservative revolution, they are here and they are very much influenced by the U.S. and they are trying to accomplish the same goals. Uh, and, and one of the key tactics, both in the U.S. and Canada, has been tax cutting. Uh, you know, what they call starve the beast. You know, if you don't collect the taxes to feed the beast, the public service, uh, you know, you can't have the program. So they sort of automatically end. Uh, and so there's been dramatic tax cutting in recent decades, all the way back, really starting in earnest with Brian Mulroney and, you know, reaching a crescendo under, under Stephen Harper. Now, you may not have noticed it that much, because it mostly is tax cutting that affects the rich. Um, but it's really significant. Let, let me just give you an example of how significant it is. If we had the same tax system in Canada today, like same at federal, municipal, and provincial levels that we had back in the year 2000, that's not that long ago, 17 years ago. If we had that same tax system, 
We'd be collecting a lot more revenue today. Does anybody want to guess how much more revenue we'd be collecting today? 30 million? 50 million. 50 million. 50 million. Do I hear? Billion. Oh, no, billion. But, yeah. Sorry, sorry, billion, yeah. Uh, any going, going, going? 1.2 billion. 1.2 Oh, okay, okay, you guys are all. Okay, here's the truth. It, we'd be collecting an extra. If we had the same tax system as 2000, we would be collecting every year an extra $78 billion. No, no, but that's huge. You know, think what you could do, think what you could do with civil service salaries. No. My job would be easier. <laughs> no, I mean, and just you could have a, for instance, an excellent national daycare program for 15 to 20 billion a year. Uh, it, you know, as Eugene Lang, he's uh, I don't know if you recognize that name, a former high-level civil service and servant in Canada. He put it: You don't need to pass laws cutting government spending when you empty Ottawa's wallet. When the cupboard's bare, there's nothing to take out of it. You know, the 70, they go to the, you go to the cupboard, there's $78 billion missing. There's all kinds of things you can't do. Now, at the same time that the conservative revolution, people are starving the beast, uh, they're also trying to destroy the public's confidence in the beast. What I mean by that is destroy the public's confidence and respect for the public service. I'm sure you're aware of that. <laughs> that Phenomena, but you know it hasn't been easy to do that. The simple truth is, Canadians actually have a pretty strong level of support and respect for the public service. And if you go, you know, built on the fact that throughout the 20th century, uh, government and the public service kind of built the country. Uh, you know, led the country successfully through two world wars. Uh, built the country's infrastructure, all kinds of public systems, hospitals, uh, health care, education, the National Post Office, CBC, etc. And it got a lot of respect for those things. Uh, in fact, respect for the civil service, um, you know, meant that the, the civil servants, the senior civil servants years ago used to be treated with great respect and reverence. People like Graham Towers and Robert Bryce, Clifford Clark, uh, and they were treated as public servants. Public, think of that name, public servants, like they serve the public. It's such an honorable term. Now the conservative ideologues, just, you know, it, it just bureaucrats. You know, it sounds like a member of the Politburo. You know, and in addition to denigrating uh, cons uh, bure uh, civil servants as bureaucrats, these conser conservative ideologues want to celebrate business leaders for their entrepreneurship, their innovation, their efficiency, their being self-made men, all that kind of thing. Uh, I love this quote by Robert Tawney, a historian who's describing the so-called self-made businessman. He says he's, he's the one who can attributes his achievements to his own unaided efforts in bland unconsciousness of a social order without whose continual support and vigilant protection he would be like a lamb bleeding in the desert. Uh, the truth is this, uh, an absolute central theme of the conservative revolution is the greater efficiency of the private sector. Something they assert constantly with no evidence whatsoever to back it up. And of course, the media just accepts it. I mean, you, how often have you heard the term, the greater efficiency of the private sector? Does anybody ever stop that you know, anchor on TV? You know, just a second, that's an opinion. That's not a fact. Uh, you know, it, it always amazed me, because if you comp compare the private and public sector, you know, and the, the idea is the private sector is so efficient that even when you add this significant profit margin that they need in order to be interested, they still theoretically end up coming in under price. 
How do they do it? It's, it's like it's magic. You know, like it's never identified. It's just stated as some kind of fact. Well, in fact, uh, you know, this alleged superiority and greater efficiency of business, th this is the explanation, this is the reason behind the explosion in the privatization of our infrastructure. Uh, you know, through P3s, public-private partnerships, uh, you know, the theoretically, these are ways to save government money, save taxpayers money, uh, but like outsourcing, it doesn't actually save government any money. These P3s, I mean, we've, we've had them for 20 years now, so there's quite a bit of experience with them. The Ontario Attorney General looked at them and concluded that in Ontario alone, because of P3s, Ontario taxpayers had ended up paying an extra eight billion, an extra eight billion, like on top of what they would have paid if the infrastructure had been developed through public sources. And that works out to about $1,500 per Ontario family. So this is significant. And yet, the Trudeau government is now taking privatization another step much deeper. They're taking this really significant step with this new Canada Infrastructure Bank. And it's based on the same faulty premise. You know, the cupboard is bare, the cupboard is bare. So therefore, we have to turn to the private sector, the people with all the money, to get their money. And that's the only way we can do our infrastructure. Well, that is simply dead wrong. In fact, it's going to cost us way more, way more to do it privately, to bring in these private sector investors, which is what Morneau was planning. If we did it the old way, like raising money uh, publicly, that is through the government issuing, municipal, or issuing government bonds, uh, we could raise, it, it'd be fantastic. We could, the interest rates are so low, you can get a 30-year government bond that pays 2.2, 2 2.5%. That's practically getting the money for free. So that this would be fantastic. Instead, if we bring private investors in, they want seven to nine percent return. It's it's extremely expensive. I'll just give you an example on a hundred million dollar investment under the public finance system. Over thirty years is an extra financing cost of forty two million. That same hundred million with private finance over thirty years isn't forty two million. It's somewhere between one hundred and fifty and 190 million, like triple or quadruple the costs. So clearly there is no benefit to the public with this, you know, privatized Canada Infrastructure Bank. But there is huge benefit to the private investors. In fact, a key part of the story of this Canada Infrastructure Bank is, takes place when Trudeau, just after he's elected in 2015, goes to Davos, you know, the big glittery fest of corporate and political power held every year in Davos. He goes there and he meets a bunch of people, particularly meets Larry Fink. Larry Fink is a very, very powerful Wall Street guy. Uh, he runs an investment place called BlackRock, which manages five trillion in investments. Uh, he was, he was um, Forbes magazine described him as the, Fink, as the 34th most powerful man in the world. So this is, this is a big player. So he, he's in Davos, he's looking for infrastructure investment. I don't know if you can see where this is going. <laughs> He's looking for infrastructure investment because like other people in the, you know, other institutional investors, mutual funds, pension funds, people that manage a lot of money, there's, it's very hard these days. The markets are very volatile. It's very hard to find safe, long-term investments. And infrastructure, it turns out, is one of them. There's a Morgan Stanley study in 2015 showing how 
what a great investment infrastructure is because, think about it, there's constant demand for the service, it's a basic service everyone needs, uh, whatever the infrastructure is providing, um, and, and that demand doesn't go away just because there's a recession, so it's recession proof, and you can get a monopoly, so you don't have to face any competition. They always love anything that can remove competition. And you can get a, a revenue stream, the classic example being like a toll road. So after Trudeau and Fink met in Davos, and they apparently hit it off, Trudeau brings BlackRock, Fink's company, into the government in an advisory capacity. He gets it involved with Morneau's group of economic advisors, which are suspicious enough, that group, already. Uh, but now then he's got BlackRock, he's got these Wall Street hotshots in there too. And what you find is plans start changing. It used to be the original plans were, you know, for low cost financing of public infrastructure. Now I happen to know this because I ran against Bill Morneau in my brief career trying to be a politician. I ran against him in 2015 in the riding of Toronto Centre, and I debated him five or six times. And I do remember him talking about low-cost financing of in infrastructure. I, I thought it sounded like a pretty good idea, actually. And I, I was thinking, geez, why doesn't the NDP develop something like that? Um, but he never mentioned, never mentioned private private investors being involved in it. Believe me, if he had, I would have been all over it. But he never mentioned it. But suddenly now, with BlackRock involved, and all these other private sector, Michael Sabian, that whole crowd, uh, when, the, when their final, when their proposals come out for this bank uh, last fall, it showed very heavy involvement of private investors. And some interesting changes. For instance, that the first time investors would be allowed to actually own our infrastructure. That had never happened before. Like with the P3s, they partner and they, um, you know, they, uh, the, the, private sector gets to oversee the construction, the development, the management over a 30-year period. But it never actually goes to the ownership of those private sector. And after the 30 years, the private sector is out and it's just fully owned and controlled by the government. But this is a different model. Under this model, the private sector investors, the Larry Rock crowd, they will get to actually own pieces of our Canadian infrastructure. And, it, and there's no restriction on them being foreigners. Uh, so that's pretty significant, because when you think about, let's just go back to the toll road for a minute. Under the P3 model, uh, as bad as it is, let's say you, you know, they, the private sector managing the toll road gets to collect the tolls for 30 years as we're paying off with the tolls, the cost of building that road. But then at the end of 30 years, the road reverts back to full Canadian ownership and management, and presumably the tolls will come off. And you know that will then be a publicly owned road without tolls. Under this model, the private owners will own the road indefinitely and have the right to charge us tolls indefinitely. It doesn't matter if they've paid off the cost of building the road, they have ownership of the road and that'll be their right to do that. I find that stunning. Let me just say, we do need an infrastructure bank, but we don't need an infrastructure bank in which Wall Street tycoons are helping design it. What we need, by the way, Fink, just a little background, Fink helped design the Wall Street bailout of the banks. 
Is there anything that could go wrong? <laughs> um, we, we need a public infrastructure bank. We need a bank modeled on something like the Business Development Bank, the Export Development Bank, because those banks have the advantages of public financing, like lower financing costs, but they have public ownership and control. In fact, I would argue we need an awful lot more public ownership. We shouldn't just be fighting privatization. We should be fighting for, what can we call it, publicization? There isn't even a name for it. Think of that, enlarging the public domain. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not against all aspects of the private sector by any means. I mean, I think, you know, we don't want the government running restaurants or designing clothes or creating furniture or anything like that. But, but I would argue that in areas where there's a strong public interest, energy, transportation, banking, healthcare, education, whatever, it cries out for government involvement and government management and ownership. It's terribly important to remember the difference between public and private. You know, when you talk about public or government, what, what is ultimately involved is a quest to advance the public good, to advance it in the interests of all members of, of society, equality and inclusiveness. Now, you could quite rightly point out governments don't always advance the public good. They certainly don't, and those governments should be gotten rid of. But that's the basic mandate of government. Private sector, corporations, on the other hand, there's, no, there's not even a concept of the public good. You know, their responsibility, the CEO, is to the shareholders. They don't they have to obey the laws, but there's no sense of advancing the public good. So I would argue that the, public, the private sector is simply inappropriate to be involved in certain areas where the public good is terribly important. Uh, conservatives, of course, want to blur that line between public and private. In fact, ultimately, what they really want to do is destroy the notion of the public good. You know, they, and, and the notion that government, you know, through government we can achieve that public good. The truth is, by collectively pooling our resources and doing things through government, we actually can accomplish great things that we can't accomplish individually or privately. And if you doubt this, let's just think for a minute about health care, public health care, and what we're able to accomplish through that in Canada versus private health care in the US you know, where tens of millions of people don't even have access to it. And yet they spend, we spend 10% of our GDP on healthcare and they spend 16%. But those are numbers. Let's, let's think about it a little bit more profoundly. A, a friend of mine a couple of years ago had a massive heart attack, ended up in hospital for six weeks, all kinds of surgery, intensive care, et cetera, et cetera. At the end of the six weeks, he walked out of that hospital and he said he was struck by the fact as he walked out, everybody was saying goodbye, he was healthy. He was struck by the fact that nobody mentioned money. You know, and the whole time he'd been in there, nobody had tried to collect a dime from him. I mean, this is why, of course, Canadians revere Medicare. I mean, the CBC a couple of years ago had that competition to choose the greatest Canadian, and we didn't choose PMs or uh, military leaders. We chose Tommy Douglas, because he was the father of Medicare. He was chosen the greatest Canadian of all time. I mean, it is a tremendous achievement when you think about it, uh, that Medicare enshrines the very principles of equality. It doesn't, you know, everyone matters, everyone's included. It doesn't matter how rich or how poor you are, uh, you are you know, entitled to the, the best medical care available. I mean, you can, you can see why this is the very opposite of the conservative revolution and the conservative vision. Uh, you know, and why, why conservatives get so frustrated by public health care. Uh, because they've managed to purge equality 
out of just about every other aspect of our society. You know, we live in a society riddled with elitism and special privilege. You know, you go to the airport these days, you fly on Air Canada, you've got to be either elite, super elite, or hyper elite. If you're not some kind of elite, you're left feeling, do I really deserve to fly? <laughs> S similarly, you know, go to an amusement park in, in near Toronto, there's Candace Wonderland, there's a pass you can buy for your child. So your child gets to butt in front of all the other kids waiting in line, way to go, way to prepare them for the world ahead. Uh, and then, of course, universities. Um, public buildings, but a couple of years ago, Peter Monk, the big mining giant, donated 35 million to U of T to create the Monk Global Affairs Center, this great big uh, house in this great big mansion on Bloor Street in Toronto, and he got it written into the contract with U of T, and U of T signed this, saying that the front door of that mansion that housed the, the Monk Center the front door would be reserved exclusively for senior faculty and guests of the Monk School, you know, Monk's personal friends, no doubt. And it went on to say that everyone else, junior faculty, students, and the general public, and by the way, the general public pays most of the bills for the Monk Center, these other people would be required to enter by the back door. <laughs> it's a public university. They signed on to this. So yet, even though you go to the airport, you go to the amusement park, you go to universities, and you, the rich can buy their way to the front of the line, when it comes to health care, when it comes to something that really matters, they cannot by their way to the front of the line. What a triumph that is. What a great thing. You know, although our society is riddled with inequality, we have 92 billionaires now in Canada, up from about three, 25 years ago. But on this key aspect, there's no front of the line. There's no special favoritism. There's no special pass. A billionaire can be sitting in the emergency department. And if a homeless person is brought in with a more urgent problem, the homeless person goes right by that billionaire. I mean, how often does that happen? Now, of course, conservatives like to try and denigrate our public health care. And they point out, oh, yeah, but in Canada, with your public health care, you know, a dog can get a hip replacement faster than a human. And I, I just want to point out, that is true. <laughs> that, no, that, that is true. And there's a reason for that. It's true because veterinary medicine is not public. It's run by private sector, profit-making, marketplace principles. And with enough money, you can buy anything you want as fast as you want. You could get your dog a facelift and liposuction if you had enough money. But here's the problem. If you don't have enough money, your dog is put down. And that's the difference between public and private. And that's why this fight is so important. So kind of to conclude, I want to I wanna emphasize that you know, it's not enough that we replace Stephen Harper's nasty ways <coughs> with Justin Trudeau's sunny ways. We need to actually confront and challenge and dismantle and roll back the conservative revolution. And I would argue your fight the out against outsourcing is part of that bigger fight. And I urge you to fight with great energy. 
Now the bad news I have to prepare you for, the bad news is the conservative revolution, as you know, is quite deeply entrenched and outsourcing, as you have seen, is quite extensive. But the good news is the public has never really supported the conservative revolution. The truth is the public likes strong public programs and services. The polls consistently show that. Yet now it's true, if you conduct a poll and you ask somebody, you know, would you like a, uh, a, a tax, oh yeah, what I wanted to say was that in fact to show how strong this support for the public services and programs is, pu the public actually, this is true in the polling, sh supports paying more tax, okay? Now, if you simply ask them, um, you know, do you want a, a tax cut? Do you want some chocolate? Do you want some ice cream? They say, no, you say, yeah, yeah, I want all those things. I want a tax cut. But if you ask a more sophisticated question, do you want a tax cut or do you want that money instead put into important public programs and public services? The, the, quite striking in almost every poll, Canadians overwhelmingly support the public investment. Now, that may not be what you typically hear. In fact, I think that is quite at odds with the kind of media narrative we always get. The media narrative tells us there's tax rage out there, right? Everybody just desperate to cut their taxes. In fact, I'm gonna tell you that's not true. In fact, there's only a very small group of Canadians who are crazed for a tax cut, who are suffering from tax rage. And that group, I'm gonna identify them right now, that group is rich, older men. You're laughing. No, 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 no. Now, now let me tell you, I've done research on this, and let me tell you how I know it's rich, older men. My research is based on a publication. It comes out from time to time in the, in, the, in the National Post, and it's called The Wealthy Boomer. And that publication consists, it's a weird little publication, it consists mostly of just two things, articles about tax rage and ads for Viagra. <laughs> So that has led me to wonder, does tax rage cause erectile dysfunction? <laughs> or, or does erectile dysfunction cause tax rage? <laughs> the point is, conservatives are impotent. <laughs> Actually, sadly, no, that's not true. <laughs> but the point is, conservatives are not impotent, but neither are we. And it's time that we demanded that this be a country with a strong public service dedicated to serving the public good, that this be a country that champions equality, that this be a country where everyone enters by the front door. Thank you very much.